Have you ever wondered how pilots know where the aircraft is in relation to the runway when they're coming into land, particularly in conditions where the visibility is not the best? So let's say in low visibility conditions. That's exactly what we'll be covering today. Welcome back to another video. My name is Deepak from Flying 101 and I release a weekly video related to flying aircraft aviation. And the concepts, the way they're explained, are meant to be quite simple to follow. If you're interested in any of this, please click that subscribe button. Don't forget to press the bell notification so you're notified every time a new video is released. All right, so let's dive into it. ALA stands for Instrument Landing System. It's a type of precision approach that has been in existence for more than 50 years, and it's by far one of the most common types of precision approaches used all around the world. Now, in case you're wondering why it's called a precision approach, that's because an ALA's approach uses a ground-based navigation equipment to provide guidance to an aircraft in both the vertical and the horizontal plane. By contrast, a non-precision approach would be a kind of approach where guidance may only be provided in the horizontal plane or the lateral plane. Uh, so again, it may employ the use of ground-based navigation aids, but these navigation aids would only provide guidance to the aircraft horizontally, not vertically. And therefore, they are called non-precision approaches. But an ALIS is a precision approach because of the fact that it provides full guidance to an aeroplane, both in the vertical and the horizontal plane, uh, to position it um, for landing. And it's also one of the approaches that facilitates an automatic landing, where planes are able to land on their own using the onboard equipment, as well as the ALIS system, which is ground-based. Now, let's look at the components that uh, constitute uh, an ALA system. So, we're talking about two transmitters to provide the guidance in the vertical and the horizontal plane. The first one we have is a localizer transmitter or, or a localizer aerial. The position of this antenna is uh, at the end of the runway. So, imagine this is the direction of the aircraft to land on the runway right over here. The localizer antenna would be on the other side usually about 300 meters from the edge of the runway. And the localizer antenna would be providing horizontal guidance to the aeroplane, so to align it with the runway. That's the job of the localizer antenna or the aerial. Now, that's how a localizer aerial transmits the beams or the lobes uh, to help an aircraft establish where it is in relation to the runway horizontally. So the transmitter is transmitting two lobes modulated at these frequencies. So we have, we have the blue lobe over here modulated at 90 hertz, and we have the red lobe modulated at 150 hertz. That's the point where they both intersect. They're both concurrent at this point. And if an aircraft were to follow this extended or the, the dotted line, which is basically the line that meets the, the intersection of these two lobes, the aircraft would be perfectly aligned with the runway center line or the extended center line, and that's what would help the pilots determine whether it's suitably positioned for landing. Again, there are some indications in the cockpit using the instrumentation that show the pilots uh, where the aircraft is in relation to the runway um, uh, center line uh, using the signal from the localizer antenna, uh, which in turn is transmitting these lobes, which are then being received by the localizer receiver on the aircraft, which then interprets the location of the aircraft uh, in relation to the extended center line, which corresponds to the point where both these lobes meet. So if an aircraft were to the left over here, let's say, to the left of the runway, uh, it would be receiving more of the 90 hertz lobe as opposed to uh, you know, the 150. And vice versa, if it was to the right of the runway, it would be receiving more of the signal of the 150 hertz uh, lobe. And so the indication in the cockpit would be uh, that the aircraft's to the right of the runway. And that's when the pilots would know that it needs to be flown to the left to bring it onto uh, the, uh, the extended runway center line, which is uh, represented by the, dotted, uh, the black dotted line over here. All right, so having talked about a localizer antenna and what its task is, now let's talk about the glide slope aerial and uh, how it fits into this whole system. The purpose of a glide slope antenna is to provide guidance to an aircraft in the vertical plane. So to bring the aircraft 
on a correct descent profile to position it suitably for landing within the touchdown zone, specifically just around the touchdown point, which is represented by those markings over there. A glide slope aerial, which is uh, depicted by that little green diagram over there. And once again, please excuse my elementary types of drawings, but that's what a glide slope aerial is. It's um, usually about 300 meters from the beginning of the runway. So once again, this is our aircraft and it's coming into land. It's about 300 meters from the runway and about 200 meters from the runway edge. That tends to be the typical position of a glide slope antenna. All right, so this little diagram depicts the radiation pattern of a glide slope aerial. Once again, we have our two lobes modulated at 90 hertz and 150 hertz as uh, shown by the green and the red drawings over here. There is an intersection point of both these lobes, which is represented by that black dotted line. And this would be the glide path that an aircraft would need to fly in order to suitably position it vertically for landing around the touchdown point over there. Now, glide slopes or glide paths typically tend to be around three degrees. So we're talking about that black dotted line, which is a glide path. It usually tends to be around three degrees. ICAO or the International Civil Aviation Organization requires glide paths to be between two degrees and four degrees. Three degrees is the norm around the world. However, there may be some deviations at certain uh, airports and runways. And what would dictate this difference is the obstacles and the terrain on the approach path. Sometimes there may be certain obstacles on the approach path and that would call for a steeper descent path. So the glide path angle would then be greater than three degrees in order to ensure the obstacle clearance on the approach path. But typically it tends to be around three degrees. So that's the most common. All right, so having talked about the various components um, that constitute an ILS system and the working principle of it. Now let's see how this information is presented to the pilots. So in this little image, we have the presentation of a primary flight display or a PFD. As the name suggests, it's the instrument in the cockpit that provides the primary flight parameters to the pilots. These two scales are the ILS deviation scales and the magenta diamonds we have over there correspond to the beams emitted by the localizer and the glide slope aerial. So remember the intersection point of the lobes? That intersection point is what it corresponds to the magenta diamonds over here. So in this particular image, we have an aircraft that's perfectly established on the localizer and the glide slope, and it's suitably positioned for landing. Now let's say if this diamond was up there, it would mean that the aircraft is below the glide path and the rate of descent would need to be reduced in order to capture the glide path. Uh, similarly, if the diamond was down there, it would mean that the aircraft is above the glide path and the rate of descent would need to be increased to capture the glide path. Similarly, for the localizer, if the diamond was to the left, it would mean that the aircraft is to the right of the localizer and so it would need to be flown to the left in order to capture the localizer signal. If it was to the right, it would mean that the aircraft is to the left and it would need to be flown to the right to establish itself on the localizer and therefore on the extended runway center line. All right, so a quick recap of what we just talked about. ALIS, which stands for Instrument Landing System, is a ground-based navigation aid that provides guidance to an aircraft both in the vertical and the horizontal plane to position it for a landing. An ALIS system comprises of two transmitters. We have the localizer aerial, which is uh, at the end of the runway or the upwind side of the runway. That's the direction of the approach. And the task of the localizer aerial is to provide guidance to the aircraft in the lateral or the horizontal plane. So to tell the aircraft, the pilots, if it is aligned with the extended runway center line and thereby bringing it um, for landing on the runway center line. We also have the glide slope aerial, which is usually next to the touchdown point. So where the aircrafts would be touching down on the runway. Uh, and it's a uh, job is to provide guidance to an aircraft in the vertical plane. So to bring it at the correct height all the way down to the landing on the runway. All right, so that was a high level overview of what an instrument landing system is, the various components that it comprises of, and how it guides pilots when they're positioning an aircraft to land. I hope that made some sense. It wasn't too difficult to follow. If you liked the video, please give it a thumbs up. If you have any questions, comments, or you have a certain topic that you would like covered, please put that in the comments below and I will do my best to cover it in a future video. Once again, thanks very much for your time and I look forward to seeing you next week when we shall talk about speeds. Have a great day.